I am so glad you convinced me that the family car should be the Defender 110. It is so beautiful inside. It's so comfortable. And it just feels indestructible. Yes, it really is. I've been waiting a long time for the new model to come out. The Defender 110, I'm telling you, it's my favorite car of all times. It's my third one. You know, I have stories of going off road. The guy managed the group. He was like, what are you doing in this beautiful car? I'm like, I'm going off road. He's like, are you sure? Because you can use one of ours. And then they look like Mad Max cars. I'm like, no, 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 no. We're going to do this. And he was shocked. Wow. Well, it's great because the Defender has been reimagined for 21st century adventure and its unparalleled off-road ability as well as its robust interior are invaluable whether you're headed towards uncharted territory or just a weekend of exploration. The Defender 110 tackles challenging surroundings with absolute confidence. The SUV conveys strength outside and in, featuring peerless technology like an intuitive driver display and an award-winning infotainment system. That's my favorite part, to keep you connected no matter where the journey takes you. Adventure is unique to everyone, and so is the Defender. Choose from the two-door Defender 90, the four-door Defender 110, or the larger Defender 130 with the ability to seat up to eight passengers. You'll find uncompromising performance in all three. So pack up and go even further with the Defender 110. Learn more at LandRoverUSA.com forward slash Defender. These days, we're all investors. Trying to be smart with our money despite our worst impulses. But at iShares, we believe that deep down inside of every investor is a better investor. One that's just waiting to be let out. Explore iShares ETFs and insights and let your best investor out. Visit iShares.com for more information. Well, that was a fun conversation, Jay. What do you think? I think it's amazing. It's been a while since we have an episode where I'm just like fly on the wall and listening to you giving advice and ideas to other people. It's been a long time since we have the Millionaire Series. You know, I like this idea of like, having people on the show that have specific issues or problems, whether it's entrepreneurial problems, creativity problems, heck, I'll do any kind of problems just for the heck of it. So we're starting this new sub series. Jay Yao, producer extraordinaire, had this idea where people come on the show and I mentor them. So every now and then we'll have an episode like this one where I'm mentoring people. And if it's a good mentoring session, I'll release it. And this was a lot of fun. Our first mentee is Jason Wright, who's trying to get the word out there about his ideas, which are unique and interesting, and what he needs to do to put himself out there more. This isn't your average business podcast, and he's not your average host. This is the James Altucher Show. anyway but you guys can chat however you guys want to those are all the books that james altcher has recommended on his show so what's your favorite book jason choose yourself and i'm not i'm not just saying well <laughs> no it's my favorite business book my favorite my favorite novel is lonesome dove and atlas shrug those are two competing ones and probably east of eden but business books probably choose yourself and the art of impossible art of impossible is that stephen kotler yeah and you're uh We'll probably talk about it today. The last interview you did with him about uh, NAR Country, man, that was awesome. Yeah, that was a really great episode, I thought. People have recommended Lonesome Dove to me for decades, and I have not yet read it. Okay, so James, I got to tell you. So my daughter, who wants to be a writer, she's finishing up as a, at, at the University of Colorado. She's She doesn't read Westerns. That's not her genre at all. And she read it, and it is now her favorite book. I mean, wow. completely something that she wouldn't have picked up except for her dad said, you've got to read this. You'll enjoy it. The, the character creation that McMurtry does in that book, off the charts. Unbelievable. You'll love it. All right. I'm, I'm looking forward to it. I'm definitely going to read it. That's, that's high praise. So um, how, what, what year is your daughter in? She's a, she graduates in May and she wow. wants to go. You're going to think she's crazy. She didn't listen to, she didn't read the article. She wants to go to New York. 
No, I don't think she's crazy at all. Like, look, I know. Particularly for young people, New York is like high impact. For young people, you don't need a city to be like financially the best place in the world. Like New York is going to crumble under its own weight, but young people are going to survive and and you know, build from the ruins hopefully. So, I mean, my my two daughters are in uh New York City and they love it. Well, she she loves it. Her boyfriend, he graduated a semester before her. He's already there. He's working for Lord Abbott in finance. And they'd had this plan that they don't want to live there forever. But while they're young, I mean, I, I think she might marry this guy. They want to spend a couple of years in the city. And we go there a lot. As a matter of fact, I was there a while back and you were doing some experiment. This is back when you were still in New York. I was, I'm in a cab and I see your face and it's like I'm supposed to like do some 800 number. And I did it and you never called me. So I don't know what was going on. Jay, was that an 800 number? It's a Google number. So it's a Google okay. voice number. So like uh, it goes to my email uh, and, and my voicemail. So I read them. But that's okay. so many calls. So I can't really filter everything. <laughs> well, it was funny because I was, I was, I'm in a cab and I'm like, this has to be one of James's just crazy experiments. I don't know what he's up to, but I got to participate. So I, I think I whatever you were supposed to do, I sent a text to the number or whatever. But anyway. Yeah, so every month for like six or seven months until the pandemic, actually, because that once the pandemic started, it didn't matter. But every month for about six or seven months, I would place a new ad in all the New York City cabs. And the idea of the experiment was it was a non ad. Like there was actually nothing that I was advertising. And right. I tried to just have a picture of me in a t shirt with no words. And that's right. the ad. And they wouldn't let me do that. They said, look, we have other advertisers. They're going to see this and think it's too weird. So just do something. So what did we have, Jay? Like we had like Morse code. We had like weird. Yeah, we have like some weird puzzles. Some yeah. Like yeah, it was, a, it was a question. I think it was like a yeah. trivia question or something like that. Yeah, when you, now that you yeah. mentioned that. I can't oh, remember. just James doing like hello or something like that. Yeah. Yeah. And then was... the experiment was just what would happen if somebody did a non-ad in a, in a, you know, everybody in New York City takes cabs at some point. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. so everybody would see it. It did sort of work in that people would stop me in the street who didn't know me at all and say, are you that cab guy? And like, like one guy stopped me. He was all excited. And, and he's like, oh my God, my five-year-old kid, he's, he's not going to believe this. Let me take a picture with you. And so this was like a reaction and it was very, very cheap to advertise in these cabs. Like, People think, oh, you need to be a big corporation to advertise in a place where potentially millions of people are going to see it. But it was like almost nothing per month. And I don't know what it is now. But then other people thought, people who knew me thought I was like advertising like crypto or something like that. But I wasn't, it was really like, like they would throw their own interpretations onto it. People who like, particularly people who didn't like me. And it was interesting to see like all the different reactions. Well, I, I figured it was, you know, I, being a longtime listener, I figured it was probably one of the experiments. You know, I've actually thought about something like that. Of course, this would be drastically more expensive. But if you just put your, if you're on a billboard, you're supposed, and you're not a lawyer, you're supposedly a celebrity or famous or you're successful. So I've thought about what if you just took like, if I took out a billboard and just put my big mug on it and put Jason Wright and a website. And it, it wouldn't matter what you did. People would, if they, if they had seen the billboard, they would think that you have some sort of celebrity status of some kind. So it's just, I've, I wanted to experiment with stuff like that too. It's just because people are weird, man. They, if they, if they, the context, if they see you there, you must be successful. They make all these assumptions. It's, it's kind of bizarre. No, you're right. And like, so, so I kind of was, that's similar to kind of what I was doing. I was going a little bit in a different direction where I wouldn't say my name. It was nothing. Like there was just basically yeah. nothing was the idea. And I think then you plant curiosity in people's mm -hmm. minds. And so yeah. late, so what happens is when you plant, when you plant mystery, it, it, it builds up this tension. And if at and when you build up that tension, it's like, it's like, think of it mystery as like sort of money in the bank. So I'm making deposits of mystery around what, not only what I'm doing, but also there was my face, but nothing else. So more every month, more and more mystery. And that I'm depositing that mystery in some sort of mental bank account across the city. And at some point, there would be enough in there that if I did a reveal, uh, and I didn't know how long that would take to build up a, a sufficient tension, it would be, 
it would be an event of some sort. It would be interesting. Yeah, and I didn't yeah, know what would it. happen or, or how long or if the experiment would work. It was just this idea of can I plant mystery in an interesting way without any reveal? So, 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 cool. so it's very self, like there's no benefit to me in doing it, it seems. I love that. You know, it's kind of like a, uh, it's kind of like a John Galt type thing. You know, like you could next, you could have that as evergreen forever. You just constantly just, you know, it's almost like, like you mentioned, it's like this conscious bank account. And if I ever need to break out, well, I can finally reveal my, I can use this, my, this book, this launch of this project. And it's like, oh, here's who that guy is that you saw in the cab. And here's why I was doing it. And here's what I'm all, really all about. You can like identify. And it is a metaphor in some sense for business. Like think about Facebook, which we all know the story of because of the social network, the movie. Mark Zuckerberg didn't want to do advertising for the, and Google didn't do advertising. All these big companies didn't do advertising for the first, I don't know, three, four, five years or more of their business. Why? Because once you do that, like people would go to Facebook and they wouldn't know, how does this make money? And you know, it, it made people feel comfortable, like calling this home for their internet presence for many years. Like now everybody's a little down on Facebook, which is fine. It still has a, a billion users a month. But back then, like everybody loved Facebook. Like it's how they were keeping in touch with people. I'm talking mm -hmm. like 2007, 2008, when it was really ramping up. And it was because he delayed this, what is the business model? Answering that question, he really built up a lot of, you know, energy for the, for the brand, the site, whatever you want to call it. And, and I think that's a strong element of the success. And look, and I'm saying all this because this will segue in, into what you and I are going to talk about a little bit, which is what you're doing and, and the, and the questions you have about your own, like, how do I get, you know, essentially the word out on, on what I do and, and, and for yourself and, and why you're special and why people should, should contact you and talk to you and, and all of these things. And that's very hard because we live in this high, high, um, everybody wants attention, but, no, but everyone has also attention deficit. Yeah. And, yeah. you know, we live in this attention deficit world where, but the irony being everyone wants attention. And I say that in a good way. Everybody wants to be seen, and and if they, particularly when they have stuff to say, as, as you do. But the premise of this is, you know, you reached out, and we've been following each other, and you had some questions, and I looked at some of your questions and and your sites and stuff. And but maybe we could talk about it. like why don't you describe who you are and 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 what you're up to? Okay, so it, it is it's a perfect segue because one of the things you said, James, and I want to just add a little bit to that. And it's one of the things I struggle with. I'm hoping you can help me kind of distill down is. You know, once you come out, like okay, so like once James Altucher says, okay, here's the the mystery is now revealed. This is what I was up to. Then you have that identity, and you've got to wear that. And that's one of the things I struggle with because right now, so I've done your. It's kind of weird because that I'm doing the uh, mentor me thing because you've been a virtual mentor of mine, probably the most prevalent virtual mentor I've had for gosh the last at least five years, and I created your hub and spoke model. Okay, so I have a podcast, The Jason Wright Show, and it is essentially, you know, the motto is improve always and always. And that was really hard for a while because I don't want to be, I'm not Tony Robbins. I'm also not being Greenfield. I'm certainly not Peter Atia. I, I don't want to be pigeonholed into one thing. And I, I've, I used to be really reluctant to say it's a self-improvement podcast, but essentially it is. I want people to, I want to be an example and have people like you that are, crushing all these different elements of life. Maybe it's health and wellness. Maybe it's Stephen Kotler and the, the process of flow. Maybe it's press filled and here's how you battle the resistance. But there's all these different elements of success that I want people to come to the Jason Wright show to realize here's how you optimize this crazy ride that we're all on called life for this short period of time. And there is no one element. You can't just, you can't be a virtuoso at all of them but you can be pretty good at those things that you have to do. We all have to breathe and we have to sleep well. We need, should eat well, all these things. So, so I've got the podcast. Then from that, when it started growing, James, I actually had no idea what I was going to do with it because I don't like it, the, the whole attention thing. Our mutual friend, James Quandall, and I have talked about this about you. You're kind of in that sweet spot on a number of levels. One, you're famous to Jason Wright right? But you can still walk down the street there in Atlanta 
and not everybody's going to be hovered around you. And, oh, my God, it's James Altucher. Did you see James Altucher, you know? Definitely, there's not going to be a lot of those. <laughs> and that's, but isn't that awesome? I mean, to me, that's, to me, that's the, that's the beauty because the person that does come up to you would be somebody like me that's going to go, oh my God, James, you've, you've really taught me so many things and we've never even met. You know, you've taken your gifts and talents and you've used them, them to have an impact on my life. Well, that makes for a more interesting conversation than just, oh God, I saw you in a movie and aren't you wonderful? And I know you don't give a shit about who I am or what I do, but let's pretend like we, you know, for a moment, sure. pretend like you care that I've seen your movie. So I have tried to build this like identity with the podcast of that. Okay, now I think what I want to do with it is teach and coach uh, on mindfulness and these health and wellness things and, and influence people in this space to, uh, to, to, a, you know, and, and also the podcast to grow so that I can continue to learn myself. I think that's the beauty of having a podcast is it's like this selfish way of getting to meet cool people. I mean, look, I'm on the James Altucher show. Had I not done my podcast, I wouldn't be here with you right now. I think that's one of the things that you and Noah Kagan talked about recently. You know, Noah made the, the point that the reason he was on your show is because he got out there, right? You just, you kind of just have to throw yourself out into this. But let's, let's actually take a, a step back. Okay. Why? So Noah Kagan was first on my show in 2014. The first mm -hmm. year I had a show actually. Why was he on the show? Now, yes, not only he reached out, but other people told me who he was and stuff. But why, why was he really on the podcast? It's not because he reached out and it's not because he put himself out there. There was a very specific reason. It's because as he put it, he was the fifth employee or something or the third mm -hmm. employee at mint.com and was fired before they got sold for hundreds of millions where he, he would have made a lot of money, but didn't. Then he was fired from Facebook where he would have made a ton of money, but he didn't. And right. he was like the fourth employee there or some, some early stage Facebook employee. And so he had a story about his failure and obviously he's telling it because a he's overcome it in some way and had solutions and his story, but I became interested in his solutions as I got to know him on the podcast. And, and he's told me several things that as I like to do on my podcast, it's like almost therapy for me. Like he kind of yeah. got me doing things, but I really, he, he, he was a good storyteller and he had a good story to tell. And so like, for instance, and, and this is all just conversation, right? So it's just, yeah. I'm going to brainstorm. Some things might be off key. Some things maybe will hit something. But yeah. like I asked you a few minutes ago, who are you? Tell us who you are. You actually still haven't told me who you are. <laughs> like right. you told me what you're interested in. And I yeah. love that. I appreciate that. And you're interested in all the things I'm interested in. But like, and I, and I went to your website. I couldn't really figure out mm -hmm. specifically who you are. And and again, I don't say this in a bad way. I, I love the content yeah. and what you're yeah. saying, but who's saying it? Who is telling me these things? Yeah. So like, so let me ask you a question. Like, Jason, who, who are you? All right. You ready? Here we go. Fifth generation East Texan. I went to a no-name university. First member of my family to graduate from college. Put myself through a little school called Stephen F. Austin State University in the oldest town in Texas, Nacogdoches. After graduating from SFA, I went to work in corporate America. My first job was with Computer Sciences Corporation. You might be one of the few people who actually knows what CSC is, James. Most people uh, my, don't. My dad worked for them. Okay. So I worked for CSC right out of school. And the reason I took the job was because it sounded, it made me sound like I was smart. I, did, I majored in communications and journalism because I hated math. But fortunately, I did a lot of things in my undergrad uh, like president of my fraternity and all that kind of crap that doesn't really mean a lot. But I got the attention of this girl whose dad was the president of one of CSC's division. And he hired me, even though I had no accounting, no, no business classes or anything. So I go to work in corporate America for six years and I hate it. I absolutely cannot stand corporate America. I wanted to come back to East Texas. I wanted to raise my daughters here, buy a business. And I didn't care what it was. I didn't care if it was a popsicle stand, a hot dog stand or whatever. I ended up buying well, why, a why buy a business instead of start a business? And by the way, I like the idea of buying a business and you've written about this, but like yep. w what brought you to that decision as opposed to starting a popsicle stand? Yeah, because I thought it was less risky. If there's, even if it sucked, there's some money coming in the door. I agree with you, yeah. And so I thought, well, I'm 28 years old at the time. I had no experience in this community that I now live in. I've lived in for 20 years. I knew not a soul here and I'd never sold a house in my life. I didn't even have my real estate license whenever I decided to do this. 
But I thought, well, it's an existing company. The barriers to entry also matched up. They were low. You, it doesn't take a lot to buy a real estate company because you're buying blue sky. And I didn't want to do the startup. Okay, I'm interested in this. Since a okay. real estate company does these one-time deals and then it's like yeah. one and done with everybody, why can't you just start? This is one where I wonder, like, what's the cash flow that you're buying? Because the cash flow could disappear when the agents disappear. Yeah, that's the risk you take. And that's what I did. These agents were probably, I mean, seriously, James, the average age of the company, well, the company was 54 years old under wow. different variations. The average agent was like 60. They weren't going anywhere. They, they were there for a reason. And a lot of those reasons they were there were reasons why hurt me a year in because I needed to shake the place up. And that's what I had to do. I literally had to take this thing apart. Once I had learned the business, learned how to recruit, learned the type of agents I wanted. But in those first few, you know, I guess the, that first year, basically, I knew they weren't going to go anywhere. And that was another reason for the purchase. How, how, did, you, how did you buy the company? <laughs> for, you'll, you will love this. Leveraged it to the hilt. I didn't have any money. I was 28. I don't come from money. And so the guy and his dad that owned the office building that the company was in, the building was worth like 400 grand. And th do you remember Carlton Sheets, the old real estate, buy, buy real estate with no money down? The tapes, James, this is old school, man. Well, anyway, he's a guy back in the day that taught you how to buy real estate with no money down. So I'm negotiating with this guy to buy his company as though I actually have the money to do it. And I don't, I don't have a pot to piss in, man. And so, but I remember in one of our conversations, he said, the building's worth 400,000. We owe 56,000 on it. One night in Houston, Texas, I'm driving down the street listening to one of these, uh, these tapes by Carlton Sheets. And he talks about how you can borrow the equity from a seller to actually finance buying his real estate. So it just, a light bulb went off. I'm like, wait a minute, they only owe 56. So I call my banker, my hometown banker the next day. And I say, I said, Lee, I said, I've got this company I'm trying to buy. I don't have any money. And I said, but an office building comes with it that's worth $400,000. They only owe 56 on it. Could I borrow 200 grand against that building, pay off the 56 and then do an owner finance note and you loan me the rest? He said, yeah. He said, but the problem is they're going to have to take second place on the lien and they're never going to do that, Jason. Especially, I'm 28. I don't know anything. And so I presented this deal to the seller and he said, yeah, no, I can't do that. I mean, this is basically mine and my dad's retirement. But here's the thing. Right after that, his dad gets sick and this guy, this the son that's been, this is the only company he's ever known. He's never had to run it. His dad always ran it. He never wanted to run it by himself. He's desperate. He calls me up. He says, I'll do the deal exactly the way you want to do it. Have your attorney draft the papers. And that's what I did. I walked away from the closing table, James, with $90,000 in working capital in my pocket. I took the 200, I paid off his 56, had a note with him for the building, had a note with my bank. And then I also financed, I put, I gave him a little bit of extra money down for the actual franchise I was buying. And I, so I had three notes. So I got into a hell of a lot of debt that day, but it worked. It just so, worked. And, and for him, it's good because as you said, he wasn't operating the business, but he was getting cash flow from it. Like his family yeah. was probably distributing cash flow. So now he's still going to get the cash flow. He's going to suddenly have a bunch of extra cash up front and he's not going to have any debt because you're going to pay exactly right. I'm, I became his annuity and I kept him on board because in, here in Texas, back then, it's changed a little bit. You had to have your license, which I eventually got through this throughout the course of this negotiation. You had to have your license for two years before you could sit for your broker's license. So I told him, I said, here's what I'll do. You stay on board for two years. I mean, he was 60 years old at the time. He wasn't ready to completely hang it up. So you stay on board for two years as my broker of record. After I've been in the business for two years, I'll get my broker's license. I'll keep you on a high split. I'll keep your son in here, a third generation, by the way. I'll keep you, him, and here's my mortgage broker. Everything will be the same. It'll be fantastic. And I think that's one of the things I'm good at, James. I actually did a, a post about this recently. When you're trying to buy a small business, I'm good at the relationship part of, especially like this, the generational businesses and the founders that just, I mean, they've just been busting their butt for 30 years. They really never thought about some big, you know, equity event. And it worked. He, he trusted me and it worked. And the son never got involved in the business. Like the, the other agents, if they were unhappy with you, they didn't complain to him or anything. That did happen a couple of times. Uh, but usually it was just some agent that, that needed to go anyway. And man, there's, see, that's the thing I haven't leveraged is that that story, the book I wrote about that, about my escape from corporate America doesn't really do justice to 
the stuff I went through, man, because yeah, they, they would do that and I'd have to fire them. It was tough. This year, you can learn more than you've ever learned before with Wondrium. Wondrium is the educational platform with content covering almost any topic you could imagine. If there were websites like Wondrium when I was a kid and there wasn't even such a thing as a website when I was a kid, I totally would have not gone to college. It's so cheap now to learn and have more fun learning using sites like Wondrium. So with Wondrium, you get huge selection of videos and courses, over 8,000 hours, flexibility to switch to audio only, great for multitasking, superb quality programs that are expert led, easy to follow, beautifully filmed, completely accessible. You can do it on your phone, tablet, TV, computer, no commercials, no tests or stress, just the enjoyment of learning. I like how they put down commercials while I'm reading kind of a commercial for them right now, but no problem. And look, I love learning on these sites. I've learned so many different things. Learn about what you love and love learning about it with Wondrium. Do what I did. Sign up for Wondrium right now. And right now, my listeners get a free month of unlimited access. You can see 8,000 hours of courses for free. This is a great opportunity. Sign up today with my special URL. Go to wondrium.com slash James. That's W O N. D R I U M dot com slash James. Wondrium dot com slash James. The future of learning is definitely online. Like it's such BS that you have to spend two hundred thousand dollars or take two hundred thousand dollars in loans and go to some fancy school when it's useless. It doesn't guarantee you a job. Most employers, including me, do not care about degrees or grades or anything like that. We want to care that you love what you're doing, that you know what you're doing, in some cases that you have experience or that you're willing to learn. But people in general love learning and are curious. Like the key to success is curiosity. And I think masterclass.com is the perfect model for online learning. I'm really happy they're, they're sponsoring uh, this episode if you're going to give a gift, give the gift of learning. Masterclass makes a meaningful gift this season for you and anyone on your list because both of you can learn from the best to become your best from leadership to effective communication to cooking. Let me tell you some of the classes I've taken. I've taken comedy from Steve Martin. I mean, can you believe I can take a class from Steve Martin on comedy or Judd Apatow, my favorite comedy director. I could take an actual class from him on writing. Wolfgang Puck on cooking, Dan Brown on writing, or Judy Bloom, who's been on this podcast, on writing. By the way, Wolfgang Puck also has been on this podcast. It's such a pleasure. I, I try to take classes all the time from masterclass.com. And whether you're watching Masterclass on TV or listening in audio mode in the app or on their site, the quality speaks for itself. It's like these Masterclass instructors are your own personal mentors that are going to help you reach the next level. How much would it cost to take one-on-one -on -one classes on comedy from Steve Martin or on chess from Gary Kasparov. You just wouldn't be able to do it. But it would, I mean, it would cost hundreds of thousands of dollars. With a Masterclass annual membership, it's $10 a month. Membership started $120 a year for unlimited access to one-on-one -on -one classes with all 180 plus Masterclass instructors. So it's not just $120 for one instructor. You get all 180 plus Masterclass instructors. Boost your confidence and find practical takeaways you can apply to your life and at work. And if you own a business or are a team leader, use Masterclass to empower and create future-ready employees and leaders. That's the real education in today's world. So this holiday season, you can give one annual membership and get one free at masterclass.com slash JAS. JAS, of course, stands for the James Altucher Show. So right now you can get two memberships for the price of one at masterclass.com slash JAS. Masterclass.com slash JAS. Offer terms apply. So let me tell you something. I read the article you wrote about how to buy a business. And okay. you didn't mention this story. <laughs> like, yeah, I know. 
Like, I'm why did you mention this story? this story? This story, first off, there's just kind of um, like this is just sort of a fact. When you write a story recommending some activity, you kind of have to establish your credentials to be writing it. So just even saying my first entrepreneurial endeavor was I bought a business. So I'm telling you this. Now that would be a poor way of doing it because I would want to know more details, but you didn't even say that. Like you just said, this is a good way to make money. You described a little bit of how to do it, but now you have, you have actually like a great story. Like we could dive into it for the whole podcast if we wanted to, but one of the things you should do is you should re rewrite that article to really tell what happened to you. And, yeah. you know, first off, you're 28, you didn't have your real estate license, you had no money and no experience, and you had never bought a business before. Right. And so how you pull that off, that's the article. Yeah. Not, yeah. not like you should do this, 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 bye. That's the article. Invite people into your home in the article and let them look around and see what's there. You know, metaphorically, of course, like tell them who you are. And then it's not an article about buying a business. It's an article about you that happens to explain how you bought the business, but it'll give, it's enough general enough that it gives people all the ideas they could think. Like as you're telling the story, I'm thinking, man, that's great. Okay. You could, I didn't know you could borrow the equity on a build on someone else's building in order to finance the acquisition of that building. Then you did owner financing. Then you worked it out in such a way psychologically with the, you know, you know, 90% of business is all psychology. So you worked it out with the father, the son, how everybody's going to be happy, dealt with the fact that there's no cash flow in the business, but you had equity in the building and, and you had the, the, I guess the equity really of the business is the track record and the brand uh, and the quality of service and keeping the son around keeps the continuity for the two exactly. years while you're establishing yourself into the business. So how to buy a business is really the story of what happened to you. I'll figure it out how to buy a business after that. But knowing your story and knowing you, that draws me into the article. All right. Can I ask you a question? Because yeah. I thought about this, James. So when I was 35, I actually wrote a book about this. So, and it's probably why I take for granted in my own subconscious kind of like when if I'm writing a blog, because back then I wrote this, gosh, 12 years ago, push play, taking your life off pause, which was about my escape from corporate America. And I wrote all the details. I've almost thought about, because obviously, I mean, I self-published it uh, and everything back before many people were doing that. And I've thought about breaking that book apart into it kind of going through kind of reverse engineering, what you would do now. Now the, 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 the thing to do would be to write a bunch of blog posts with more detail, like you mentioned, and then release a book about it. This one, I have a book that no one's read, you know, because it was written by a 35 year old with very little talent, but I did go into the details of how I financed that deal. And I, I don't feel like I've leveraged that story enough. So I'm really glad that you brought this up because I do need help on that. And here's another reason why I don't really talk about that book much, man. I was, a, I, was, I, I was giving myself way too much credit, I think, at 35. Like what I should have done, like the 48-year-old Jason would look back on that and go, you know, why don't you write about how you sold the company too early? You didn't spend the money. Once you started making money in it, you didn't scale it up to the, to the size you could have. I mean, there's more story, I think, in the failures that came by not leveraging that early, almost happenstance success. Of, of course. And by the way, of course you had failure. You were 28 years old with no experience, <laughs> no real estate license. You had never bought a business for all the things I said earlier that were made for an interesting story were also the reasons that of course you're going to fail <laughs> and, right. or have some failure. I'm not saying it failed. I, I don't know, but... You, but but you're going to have some failure in this adventure. It's an adventure story. And, yeah. and instead you gave me, um, an, an advice column with no story. And even like the, the old advice columnist from like the seventies and eighties, dear Abby, you know, mm -hmm. famous advice columnist from back in the day, it started with a story because it's the letter. Oh, my husband goes to strip clubs. What should I do? Like there's right. a she, the letter would describe what she would see when she followed the husband. Like, so there was a story. I remember it 40 years later. I remember the story. And right. you, you know, now we're in this world where everybody is using all these different means of communicating like podcast, book, articles, and on and on tweets on, on and on Facebook posts. But you know, in order for the message to go from you to me, it has to travel 
on a bridge. The bridge right. is the story. Like you have to, like to get your ideas from your head to my head, they've got to travel on a story. And cause otherwise there's, there's, I'm going to watch TikTok where basically, you know, these superheroes are like jumping off, doing quadruple flips off buildings into oceans and whatever. And right. they're amazing. So like, I'm just going to default to that. Cause that's, I don't need to see the, I I'm seeing like magic in front of me with these people. It's like a, a trick, and, right. but you have this great story. That's also a trick. And then it's a matter of refining the skill of describing that story. Like, you know, going, you know, going to the worst possible moment in the whole thing. And that's your first line. And then on and on there's various, you know, writing as a skill, you have the right ideas and you're writing those ideas well, but you, you have to write the story well, but you just told me the story in a good way. It's just, you don't, as, as Seth Godin would say, you don't have talkers block. So, and you had no problem telling me the story, but something is, it was, is blocking you from, from writing these stories. Like maybe you were afraid, oh, I can't repeat what I wrote in a book that no one read, but, but you kind of answered the question right in that sentence. No one read it. So why can't you repeat it? And by the way, even if someone read it, if you tell, if you told it starting from a different failure point, you could tell the exact same story and everyone respects that and appreciates that. You, you know, you had another article on positive thinking. Well, what's a time when you had negative thinking and hmm. you really wished you had known about positive thinking or what was your first exposure to kind of the science of positive thinking and what happened to you when, when you realized this? And like, I need to know that for a lot of reasons, one, to trust you two, cause I need to be interested in you to tell your story. Why did, why does someone hire somebody? Why would you hire someone? Maybe because they have the skills, but also because you like them. You want to, you want to be their friend. You want them, you know, to like you, why would you want that? Because they're telling you stories about themselves and you're relating on some level and blah, blah, blah. So that's a key thing. Like you, it see, it feels to me, you're doing all the right things, but it feels to me, there's something blocking you from sharing bits and pieces of yourself. I think you're exactly right. And I think I just, and, and this is going to sound trite, but I think a lot of times for me, I don't color. Out, it's so weird to say, I don't color outside the lines because I do this kind of just a lot of random stuff. But like, I heard this, this, someone once said, you, you, you never be the hero of your own story. And I think I take that to extremes. I think I take it to the extreme that, well, and it's a lot of imposter syndrome too, James. I mean, like when I, I look I back- I hear you completely. That's one of my biggest problems. Like I remember back whenever I bought that company at 28, there was struggle and it was hard and everything. But for me, it was like, it wasn't that, it wasn't so hard. That I'm like, why doesn't everybody just do this? If you get sick of your job, just go buy a business. And so it's like, I don't know. I think I take for granted sometimes how tough it was. And so I, I, and I just don't consider myself all that bright. I just, I, I think I was, I just, you know, it's just like, it's hard to, it's really hard for me to like overcome the imposter syndrome aspect of it. I, I totally get it. I mean, it takes a little bit of hubris to think people are going to be interested in my story, but yeah. that, that is a function of the way you tell it. It's not a function of you, it's a, it's a kind of a skill. So right. how do you tell a story like this? Well, you had, I don't know. I'm again, I didn't fill in all the details of who you are here, but you had quit your job maybe, and mm -hmm. you had no idea what to do next. You had a young bride, maybe planning on kids on the way. You're back to your hometown instead of the big city. And what were you going to do? Your money was running out and you couldn't buy a business. You're 28. The banks laughed at you. You're interested in real estate. You have no license and years to go before you could be a broker. The one company you approached, the guy said, no way. I'm not going to be in second place on a, on a lien. So you had no hope. You were at your wits end and the money was running out. This is all probably true or close to the truth. And that's a, that's a story. It's not actually, you're not a, such a great hero there. And then yeah. all these 60 year olds who don't like you because you're 28, they're going to be your employees and you have to somehow communicate leadership to them when you've never been a leader right. and, and, and they had been, so they're still going to look down on you. And that's hard. And yeah. you could express that. And I'm sure you say it was easy, but I'm sure, I mean, you, sh you said it was easier than you thought it would be, but I'm sure there was a lot of pain in that struggle too. Oh How am I going to get these people to like me? How am I going to convince this guy to do this deal. How, what am I going to tell my wife if it doesn't work out? Like all these things. 
And, you know, you don't have to be a hero in the traditional sense where, oh yeah, you're going to kill the Death Star and, you know, be <laughs> right. a superstar. You know, there's trouble in, in, the, in the horizon in this story. Yeah, yeah. And, and one of the things that I've, that I also that I like, that I've wanted to leverage the story for. So I mentioned the Carlton Sheets story about how it kind of clued me in on, and I know you've, you, I've, you've had guests on, you know about the reticular activating system and, and stuff like that in your brain that is constantly scanning your subconscious to bring something to the conscious. Man, it's, I've, I've, I've wanted to use that story for kind of the cognizant stuff that I'd like to teach other entrepreneurs. If you're const, if you tell your brain to constantly, this is the goal, this is the vision, this is the mission. And like for me, man, I had to get out of corporate America. I just had to, it was, the, it was, it was do or die for me. And so my brain knew that. And so it was the reticular activating system that heard that message from Carlton Sheets and then applied it, kind of had idea sex with it. That, you know, the, instead of buying, yeah. buying real estate with no money down, well, you can leverage that same principle to actually acquire a business through a fully leveraged buyout and it all came together. And so I do think it could, I do think it's a, it's an underutilized life experience I've had. And man, there's so many funny stories along the way. Just, just, just crazy stuff that happened again at 28 years old. I'm going and trying to look like I know what I'm doing, trying to exude the confidence that, you know, having to fire right. people that are three times my age and stuff. It right. was, so, it was so by the way, instead of just having one article about buying a business, sounds like you have 30 different articles because yeah. each one of these is a relatable, important story. How do you fire people three times your age? There is no way to do it. It sucks. Yeah. And so there's no beating around it. It's not like you're, everybody knows that that's not going to be easy. So it's your story that we want to, here because then maybe just like you got ideas activated by listening to Carlton sheets uh you're only going to activate ideas for people if you're telling your story and uh like when i read like you know the owner's manual of a car um it doesn't gonna it doesn't excite me for any ideas but if i watch the movie ford versus ferrari yeah. i get excited on ideas and and because that's a story uh, and, uh, by the way, I don't even have a driver's license, so I don't know why I'd be reading the owner ma owner's <laughs> manual of a car, but, uh, uh, I don't have a driver's license cause I'm not legally allowed to anymore. But my point is starting with this story is what would draw people in. And I feel like I can't just say, do this and, and, you know, see what happens there's some reason why I feel like you haven't done it. And I, I feel like you say, okay, I have imposter syndrome. That's not quite enough. There's okay. something else that I've, is why you're not doing this. I've got it, man. I, I've got it for you. So, so you, you were talking to, I don't think it was in your most recent interview with Cal Fussman, but you brought up a great point. I was like yelling at the radio going, James, gosh, you, you get it. You were talking about bird watching. Do you remember that? Do you remember that? Yeah. That, that analogy. Okay. Dude, I'm the same way. It's not enough for me to listen to the James Altucher podcast. I need to go start a podcast. It's not enough for me to just be a bird watcher. No, I got to go be whatever the, the professional bird people are called. I got to learn everything about it. And then I got to sure. teach you about, I have this. And the thing is too, James, like you, but unlike you, uh, you've got more. And I don't, I don't say this is false humility. Please understand. I'm a sincere guy. You, you have more brain power than I do. So I'm the type of guy that I can do a lot of things good enough. And I can almost do anything. If you were to throw me into, I don't know, almost any scenario, it's kind of like the idea with the real estate company. I will figure out how to run it good enough to make a living and probably, but then I'll, then I'll see something else I want to do and I'll move on. I can do that thing. So I have a real hard time. I, I can't be a bird watcher. I can't listen to you talk about longevity and aging with Stephen Kotler. I want to, I mean, I pre-ordered the book way back. I'm like, when I get in our country, no, I got to take that, digest it, and then go teach people how to leverage the plasticity of their brain. That's a problem for me. I don't think that's a problem. I think that's a great thing because, I mean, essentially, that's what writers do, right? And by writers, I'm not, this is not an episode about writing. But that's one of my dreams, so I'm glad you're going here.
Oh my gosh, I love these clothes. Mizzen and Maine, that's M-I-Z-Z-E-N and Maine. It really is the most comfortable work clothes. Travel clothes, I'm tra- I am had to travel this whole week. I'm traveling for a week and a half and I just took Mizzen and Maine clothes with me. Close out 2023 in style with comfortable, breathable, packable, and machine washable pieces from Mizzen and Maine. As you wrap up your year-end goals, enjoy a Mizzen and Main dress shirt that you can wear confidently. I like that they've got very, very just nice, solid colors. I don't really like to get all fancy in patterns and everything, although they do have some pattern shirts, but very comfortable clothes, stretchable pants. It's just super comfortable, but they look professional and they, you can wear them casually or professionally. I like some of their flannel shirts or untuck shirts. I love untuck. I never tuck in. So again, uh, whether you're shopping for a special someone or giving yourself the gift you really want, I just buy myself gifts. Mizzen and Maine is the perfect gift for any guy who works, travels, and or cares about looking and feeling great. As you could tell by my many photos across the internet, I care about looking fantastic. I'm practically a model. And let's be honest. Every guy loves to look great. So again, shop now at mizzenandmain.com and save 20% when you spend $130 or more using promo code James. That's promo code James at Mizzen and Main, M-I-Z-Z-E-N and Main.com. You know what I love about fantasy sports is that even though I'm not going to be a great basketball player or a baseball player or a football player or whatever, I feel like I get to participate and make decisions and use my knowledge of these different leagues to, or these different sports to, to compete. So it's like I can pick my team or I can pick my favorite players and I could use my knowledge to make predictions and maybe even make money. So with the basketball season here, you can now pick combo projections across football and basketball from the specials league on prize picks. This is a league created specifically for combo projections that include two or more players from different sports or leagues. Want to play alongside some of prize picks, favorite players like rapper Meek Mill and comedian Andrew Schultz, who's also been a guest on this podcast and I've been a guest on his. You can now find community plays under the promos tab of the app to view entries for some of the biggest names in the prize picks community each week. Look, prize picks even offers a reboot policy so that your entries stay in play. Even if one of your players gets injured for football and basketball games, if you have a player who exits the game in the first half and does not return in the second, that player is rebooted. Prize picks is the only daily fantasy sports platform with an injury insurance policy. What? So, I love playing it. I love anywhere where I can use analytical ability with my interests to demonstrate some skill and maybe make some money. And I like the game like aspect. I do wish they had chess as a category on prizepicks.com, but I'll set up for what they've got. Maybe I should make my own fantasy chess league. But in any case, I love prize picks. Go to prizepicks.com slash James. Use code James for a first deposit match up to a hundred dollars. That's the easiest hundred dollars you're ever going to make. So that's prizepicks.com slash James and use code James daily fantasy sports made easy. What you originally asked me was basically you have a podcast, you're a speaker, you're, you are a writer, you have books, you have articles, uh, you have courses, your website has all these things on it and links to it and and you're in other places and on LinkedIn, you can find links to stuff. But the question you had was how do you get, you know, you're doing all these things, which is that spoken wheel idea. Like, Mm -hmm. you know, the wheel is like kind of this core concept that you want to communicate. And then the spokes are all the ways to do it. Like, Oh, Facebook posts, podcasts, book articles, but you have, you want to do it more effectively. So you draw people in and, you know, one idea is telling your story and, and suddenly because you're now you're unleashed a little bit, like, Oh, you know, now you have all these stories, this, 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 and you probably talked peripherally right now about 10 different stories related to this one event in your life. And, uh, 
So instead of like a three paragraph article about buying a business, you have like all these different articles and Twitter threads and Facebook posts and podcast episodes that you could do about around this story. And I get it with the imposter syndrome, like that is going to happen, but you don't want that to be an excuse because you could mm -hmm. still do it and see how it feels yeah. before you not do it because of imposter syndrome. So that's why I'm saying, think about, okay, maybe you don't want to do it for some reason, or like maybe you're just shy about telling stories about yourself, or maybe you're embarrassed. Like sometimes I don't tell stories because I might, I had to get over being embarrassed about different things. And I definitely had to get over, no one's going to want to listen to this. Why would they listen to my story? People want to listen to other people's stories. Um, you're right. Don't be the hero of your own story. Like really bad writing is, Hey, I played basketball in high school and I have a, you know, 40 inch foot, you know, vertical <laughs> jump and blah, blah, blah. And I dunk all the time. Like that's a bad writing and a bad story. So you're yeah. that kind of hero you don't want to be, but a hero, you could have a hero in a tragedy too. So, yeah. and, and most stories really are tragedies because life's kind of tragic. And one, one thing to think about is how can the package that you're wrapping your ideas around in could be a little bit more effective by including your story. The only thing you know really is your own story. And yep. then even when you read stuff in like a book, okay, you're not going to just summarize the book. You're going to tell why this book is impactful to you personally. Like what happened to you that you even were listening to Carlton Sheets? Like that's a story. What happened to you that, you know, you even wanted to know about big fancy things like the reticular activating system. <laughs> like that's a story. Like I've never even thought of it that way, but like there's stories around all of these things and and the positive thinking stuff There's probably stories around that. Cause I'm sure you didn't always think positively. You had to learn to, that this was an important thing for your life. And it's, it's hard for some people to think positively. Some people naturally have it. Maybe you naturally have it. I don't naturally have it. It's very difficult for me to think positively sometimes. And so I want to read from people who can tell me how they did it. And, and then when I can do it, I want to tell the story of how someone who is so bad at, at positive thinking that this is how I needed to do it and then wanted to do it and then couldn't do it and then did it. And then this is what happened. And then I failed again at doing it. And so I had to restart again to do it. That's a story where you could be a good hero and not have too much ego to it and so on. I love that. And one of the things you remind me of is that I, that now I've got, I mean, the great idea. And you do this, I think in your stories, like you'll, you'll start out with just like, like your, like your newsletter or something like, oh my God, I didn't think this would ever happen to me. And then you'll kind of, you'll kind of do like, you'll kind of the Tarantino thing where the end of the story will come first. And then you kind of get to it and you see all the lessons within it as you go. That's something, dude, I have never done, James. I have never like a great, great example. One of the things that led me here to Tyler and buying this business, sitting at my desk at WorldCom back then, crying. I mean, literally a grown freaking man sitting there weeping at, in misery at this hellhole that I had, you know, found myself in. And then just, you know, and so- Were you in Mississippi? Started, no, I never went to Clinton. I, uh, I was in Houston. And the, 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 the story of my- hopscotching career. I was actually before the job before last out in corporate America was basically Enron. I was there with, with the collapse of Enron and, uh, and from have Enron. you, have you written this? Is this, can I find this story on your website? You're no. at Enron and WorldCom. And then I was at, yes, exactly. I was with all these crooked companies. And then I've got another corporate disaster in my, in my, uh, in my portfolio. I went to work for, um, for Home Depot when Bob Nardelli became the first outside CEO after Enron collapsed. And Nardelli gets, I think, a bad rap to some degree, but I was there working for him and Dennis Donovan whenever everybody hated Nardelli. I mean, you know, he just, he came in. You basically have like this trifecta of like perfect <laughs> business stories. I mean, yeah. WorldCom, I'll tell you the exact month you were crying was July, 2002. No, it was terrible. <laughs> yes. It was terrible. I was crying because I was buying, <laughs> I was a day trading WorldCom stock and I did not expect it to go bankrupt. I was just an idiot. I didn't know anything about what I was doing then. Yeah. And yeah. so 2001, 2002, July, 2002, I think it was like, like July, or June 20th, I forget the exact day, but it was around that time. 
and it's horrible. So yeah, that's a story. And Enron, I'm sure that's a story. So so again, I'm I'm not gonna beat this dead horse more. That's one thing which, you know, it's not that you need more places to put your stuff. You're putting your place. There's no magic trick there. You're putting your your stuff in in different places. But I think you should experiment with, you know, telling these stories, you know, and you don't have to have an idea yet of what the story is about. Like, okay, you, let's say you say to yourself, I'm going to tell the story of how to buy this or how I bought this business. And then what I would do is I would read some really good short stories mm-hmm. that are sort of semi-autobiographical, like, I don't know, an article by... Hunter S. Thompson, his like always autobiographical. Mm-hmm. And he had a very unique story, or Charles Bukowski, or or Raymond Carver, or even Hemingway had a very uh, autobiographical way of mm-hmm. writing his short stories. And so, get the kind of flavor of these people who write sort of these autobiographical fictional short stories, and and then write your story, and yeah. then then erase it and write it again because you'll write it better the second time, and. And then you start to see what it's really about. And, and, and then you look at it from another angle, write it again. What was that about? Oh, that turned out to be about dealing with, you know, firing people three times my age when my grandfather used to beat me when I was a kid. So it was scary as hell to like fire, you know, people three (laughs) times my age. I mean, I made up the thing about your grandpa. I don't know what happened (laughs) if your grandpa beat you or anything, but like these these are all these stories could be impactful in uni- in unique ways, but that's what makes it relatable. Everyone's got their unique, you know, r- horrible things that have happened to them. And, and I think, and then, t- you know, tell that on your podcast or write, make a Twitter thread. Like, here's how I bought, you know, a business that ended up generating, you know, millions a year or whatever it was. Mm-hmm. And then write a Twitter thread, write a Facebook post and let your friends see it and they'll share it. And then soon people who are not your friends will see it or answer questions on Quora, but answer them with your story. So then mm-hmm. people share it. You know, if they just, if you just put a technique that might work once or twice, but it's, it doesn't give you material for many things. So telling your stories gives you lots of material for, you know, talking about all the different aspects of this. So, cause you could be as fine tuned or as general as you want. And, uh, uh, that's how, I would kind of go through all of your articles because they're all great ideas and they're all about great concepts and interesting concepts. And I'll say what your website is, you know, we'll, we'll describe it in the intro or the conclusion or whatever, but you know, it's Jason right now, W R G H T N O W and.com. And I would start writing. You don't have to rewrite those. Just start writing a new articles with these stories. Cause that's what's going to rise up on SEO. That's what people are going to share. Oh, I saw this thing on Twitter. You got, you got to check it out. I'm going to share it. And you know, that's really how to get your, your message across effectively. So then people might go and buy your book. People might hire you more as a speaker. Other people are going to say, Oh, he had this story. I'm going to listen to his podcast to hear some of his other stories. Um, or the stories he pulls out of people cause he knows what it's like. And that would be interesting. You know, and that's 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 great advice. And like I'm thinking about how you, how I could leverage that with the podcast because I love to get on the podcast and just tell stories. You know, I'm, it's you know it's fun to get guests and it's more engaging to get guests. That's what I like to do. But an interview show sometimes you just I, I I've been trying to again imposter syndrome. I'm thinking nobody wants to just listen to Jason Wright. And let's face it, if I've got a good guest, that makes for better content. But I think one of the cool ways to and tell me what you think about this. I think one of the cool ways to leverage those stories is kind of go the par- Paul Harvey, the rest of the story route. Because I've been looking for some way to do that. But again, I start out, you know, I was, it was 2001. I just found out my company was bankrupt. I was sitting at my desk weeping. And then, you know, and it kind of like that. And then the rest of the story. But then I ended up blah, 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 blah. You know, kind of, that could be kind of a cool, uh, cool, yeah, cool concept. I mean, look, you know, the Paul Harvey approach, the modern day versions of Paul Harvey are like people like Ryan Holiday or Robert Greene. Yep. Yep. They don't tell much of their own stories, but yep. they are great. Sto- like they take a concept like ego is the enemy or, yep. or the, the 48 laws of power and they slice and dice it into like a hundred different stories. And they tell the story of Babe Ruth or Napoleon mm-hmm. or, mm-hmm. you know, uh, uh, whoever. 
and uh, that's compelling content as well. From I, I always think the most compelling is when you tell your own story. And so yeah. then you don't have to do any research, by the way, because you know your own story. Yeah. You just have, yeah, you just have to, um, you have to like make sure you're cutting away the shell that you're revealing the real honesty that's wrapped inside the story of, yeah. of your life. So like when you say you don't want to be the hero of your own story, okay, all that is excess. The stuff where you're a hero, that's excess packaging and wrapping around around the real story. The real story is is brutal, yeah. and that's what you want to show and 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 sometimes like one time when i was first kind of getting into this style i was i was most this is like in the oos and i was writing fine more financially related books and i was also raising money for businesses or my hedge fund or whatever and so i wrote this book and it starts off saying talking a little bit not a lot but a little bit about some of the failures and things i experienced and i gave it to a friend of mine and he's like i can't he, he said, I can't show this to potential investors for you. You're talking about how you went broke. Why would they invest in anything you did? So there's that also. It's hard sometimes to get over that feeling. And it took me a while, but he was just simply wrong. And yeah. people became more interested in, you know, showing me business opportunities because they related to me because they had all, no one is like born a success. Even if you inherited money, you're probably not a success. Again, my point is, this is not a writing episode, but this is how to be out there and how to be yeah. effective at being out there and how to get more speaking gigs and more consulting gigs and people interested in buying your book. And, and this is just one method, but I noticed this when looking at your site and your stories and things like that, that you weren't telling me who you were. You were telling me how to think positively and why it's important, which I appreciate and, I, and, I, and that's great, but I need to know why I'm reading this. Why am I listening to you? And I'm not saying you don't, do that because you have interesting things to say and, and good things to say, but it could be done. I feel a little more effectively, or you could try it and see what happens. No, I think it's, I think it's great. I think I just needed, again, I think I need, I needed that permission because it, it, it is, is got as, as weird as that sounds, you know, it's like, um, and now, and as I, and just you saying that now my mind's going in all these different ways. And it's one of the things I struggle with is because like, who the hell am I to tell you to have a growth mindset if I'm not Carol Dweck? You know, well, well, I can tell you how a growth mindset has completely changed my life in being willing to start a podcast, even though I don't think I'm good at audio, the technical aspect of it. Right. So what's interesting to me there is, of course, like, so Carol Dweck wrote this book, Mindset, about the difference between what's called a fixed mindset. Like, let's say somebody who, you, let's say your parents told you you were smart all your life, your teachers told you you were smart. Your friends thought you were the smartest person in the world. And then suddenly you could do something really stupid and everyone sees like you're so you might quit because a fixed mindset can't adapt to that inf new information that they might not be as smart as they thought and, and grow at that, that, which is a growth mindset. So what you're telling me is that to some extent you've had to deal with a little bit of a fixed mindset. Oh, I'm not dude. the type of person who's good at audio. That's a fixed mindset, but you mm. overcame that when perhaps when reading her book, perhaps through other experiences related to that. And you realize, oh, I've got a, I mean, a lot of people read her book and say, oh, well, I don't need to worry. I have a growth mindset. <laughs> right. I was like that when I first read her book. And then I realized, you know what? I have a serious fixed mindset about everything. And yeah. I have to remind myself of that to have a growth mindset. And by the way, it's not enough for me to just say that. I have to tell situations where I had a fixed mindset and, you know, then describe how I, how, or if I even overcame that. But this is the meat of the ideas. I love that. I think that's incredible advice, James. And I will absolutely do that. I will leverage more of those stories. And, and that's one of the things, like I'm, I told you that I had created some courses. That's where I have been willing, again, because I guess, because it's, as silly as it sounds, because I look at it as kind of a negative, I have had a horrible fixed mindset for most of my life. It's, it's the reason why I was a communications major with journalism as an emphasis is because I wasn't good at math. And I thought, well, if you're either good at math or you're not, and I'm not, so therefore I better be a journalism major. Then I become a journalism major and I was really good at news writing. But I'm like, wait a minute, I go to Stephen F. Austin State University. CNN isn't looking for journalists from, from Stephen F. Austin State University. And by the way, right across the hall is the broadcast journalism department. Man, it'd be really cool to be on the news, but everybody wants to do that. And I can't do that. I'm just a kid from Sulphur Springs. I can't do that. I, just, I just had this fixed mindset my whole yeah. life. 
until, and that's one of the things, it's easy for me because I've been so impacted by it to be able to tell, you know, you or somebody else say, hey, look, a fixed mindset will appear where you least expect it. You know, when, when couples split up because they go, well, just don't love her anymore. She doesn't love me anymore. We're out of love. So therefore that's it. Well, what if you could grow your relationship? It, it, it shows up in all these different areas of life. And that's easy for me because I don't mind, because I'm not the hero. I'm just saying, hey, I'm basically like a recovering, you know, fixed mindset sufferer who now has a growth mindset. So I think if I can apply that, that same idea that it's not just me talking about, hey, I, I'm this unbelievable, this, this, I was this wonderkin at 28 that bought his first business, you know, and did all these things. But instead, no, here's how it, here's the things that happened that led to it. And here, here's all the ways I almost screwed it up as part of the process. Yeah, I think that's really good advice. I can, I can totally do that. Yeah, and, and look, I, I, there's always like fear, like you mentioned the imposter syndrome, but there's also the like, oh, if I tell about a failure, is that too personal? Are people gonna think I'm an idiot? You know, I have to put up this front that I know what I'm talking about. So I have to appear like an expert. Like there's all these, this self-talk that you could do that's really harmful that, uh, you know, is incorrect also. Like I could tell myself, oh, I'm a certain age now. So it's too late for me to do X, Y, or Z. You know, that's what I talked to Stephen Kotler about was like yeah. trying to succeed at high performance things when you're a little bit older. And that's a story that I could, I, that I, in fact, I do tell myself, but it's just a story. It's probably not true. Most of the things we tell ourselves are not true, but our brain is protecting us. So it tells these fictional stories. So we feel good, like, like sugar. And, uh, but writing, you know, and telling your story helps you saying things out loud or writing them down helps you to combat the brain's ability to tell you all of its fictions. So you know, and then that gets your message out. Yeah. You know, and that's one of the things I was going to ask you. So I've been reading a lot of um, Carl Jung lately on just the authenticity and the, the, the kind of the, the power you release whenever you're your, your authentic self. Uh, and, and now that I'm older, I really don't care what people think about me. Like, I hate that question when people come up to you and so what do you do? Well, it's really all they're asking is, so do you make more money than I do? You know, that's really all they care about. You know, are you are you successful? Do yeah. I need to? Is there anything I can get from you? And um, and so I, I think I'm pretty comfortable to the to the now, which which hampered me for a long time. I thought I had to have this. Why I went to work for CSC again. It had computer science in the the name of the company. So I thought, well, people will think I'm smart if I go work here. And now I don't give a damn about what people think about me necessarily. Uh, do you feel like you've reached a point in your life where? you are truly authentic in what you're doing because I, I, again, it's not false flattery. I see you're, you're able to pursue a lot of different pursuits. Like I think the, the comedian where you were on the subway doing stand up, and then you buy a comedy club, man, that is kind of the ultimate in a growth mindset, you know, endeavor to be able to go, I'm going to go do comedy at some of the toughest levels. Do you think that came as a result of you getting comfortable having talked about your vulnerabilities. You, you mean, that's kind of what one of your claim to fame is you've been very transparent with the downside. Do you think that's where kind of you launched when you started getting comfortable with that? I, I don't know because every time I think, for instance, every time I think I don't care about what people think of me, something happens where I'm really upset about what someone thinks about me. <laughs> and so, and every time I think, okay, now I feel like I'm being pretty authentic something happens where I realize it wasn't as effective as I wanted to be. And I can't figure out why, like mm. comedy is a good example. I would, I went into it a, with a fixed mindset thinking, Oh, I'm going to be able to do this. And when it's actually like one of the most difficult things I ever did. And it took me like a couple of years to realize that. And, and then for some reason I had, a, I have no problem telling my story with writing or, or podcasting or, or speaking public speaking, but for some reason I couldn't tell my story doing comedy. And I, I don't know what the issue was. And, and I still would have a problem with it. Cause I, I would think like, how you think, Oh, no one's going to be, how am I going to make people laugh every 15 seconds if I'm telling my story? And mm. so again, there was, maybe there was a fixed mindset thing going on there. Like I, I found a good balance, which I was able to express my personality through my current interactions with 
things. So I didn't have to tell my past stories. I could tell this happened to me yesterday. And, and I was able to be, find some authenticity doing that, but I was still, let's say even seven years into it, I was still early in the process. And, uh, I never fully, I feel became as authentic as I wanted to be in, in comedy. But so I understand how it could be difficult depending on the medium you're using and it's a skill to be learned, but yeah, I, I, I don't know. The, so as a long way of saying, I don't really know the answer. I was, I've always been trying to be as authentic as possible, but it's like an, it's an infinite process. Like it goes on forever and ever. Uh, like once you peel away one layer and you think you've done it sooner or later, you realize, Oh, there's another layer I didn't get to. And, yeah. and then you realize, Oh, now there's this other layer I didn't really get to. And the skill is not a writing skill or a creativity skill. The skill is like a trying to be more and more self aware, like really questioning yourself. Like, is this really true about what I'm saying and, and diving as deep as, as you can into that. And so with comedy, I definitely started off not authentic at all. And I was still peeling those layers when many years later, when, when I basically stopped doing it to, in order to pursue other things. Yeah. So that's a long way of, of saying it's a process. All right. Now, I want to ask you something just from a tactical standpoint, since we've been talking about writing. So you've talked about how you were just writing so many freaking articles, like almost you were writing art articles like daily, right? Back yeah, whenever I was, the, the, I was the, writing an article every single day. Okay. So it is not hard for me at all to sit down and pound out a thousand words. That's just easy for me. But here's what I do, James. If I'm writing an article, like the ones you read about just kind of general topics, I always feel like I need to incorporate some study to link to something that Stephen Kotler referenced. Something. Otherwise, it won't have authenticity because, again, who the hell am I to tell you what to do about getting into a flow state? How, right. would, so, you, how would you do that, that level of volume? So, so usually I won't talk about studies okay. because – a, I'm not a scientist, so uh, you know nobody's interested in like reading up uh, parentheses. You know, for example, see you know right. this author and this author published at the University of Washington, blah blah blah. Like, okay, and also some of those times, those studies, they're very interesting from an academic point of view, but they're not. I can't figure out the application in real life. So again, all you've got is your own experience. You, you're a laboratory of one. And, you know, or, or a science study of one, and that's all you got. Those studies, they may or may not apply to what you're saying. Like, okay, here's a study. Uh, th this is a real study. Somebody took a bunch of Yale University students and put them on New York City subways and said, ask random people if you could, if, if they could get up so you could sit at their, in their seat. And something like 60% of the people or 70% of the people just without asking what's your reason would get up and give you their seat. And then there's ways to slice this, like, uh, Oh, the, how comfortable did the students feel asking these questions and so on. But okay. That's an interesting study, but how am I going to use that? Does that mean I can ask people to do things and they'll do it? Like, I don't want to ask somebody for their subway seat. So right. what am I, what, how do I use this information? There's no, it sounds like it's useful, but it actually isn't useful at all. So yeah. I have to start from a different point, not that study, but, from the time I really needed to ask, Hey, you know, so-and-so can I go on your podcast to promote my book? That's hard for me. And mm. that is, feels impossible. doesn't matter what the studies say. doesn't matter that people want to, to be asked for help. Sometimes they don't actually. And, uh, uh, so how do I, how did I deal with this when I really needed help? And that was a challenge for me because I hate asking people for help. And, I mean, I even, I even was paid by a publisher to write a book called the power of ask. And because I couldn't do it for myself, I couldn't write the book. I had to return the money and <laughs> you know, it's, it's, it's very difficult. And I, and by the way, I don't even like authors who rely only on studies and a lot of self-help books, for instance, are like that. I don't like those books. I prefer, you know, again, like, let's just take Ryan holiday as an example, or Robert green, they tell stories. I never see the they have a bibliography, I'm sure, somewhere in the book, but I never even look at it. And I just take the word for it. This happened to Napoleon. This happened to Martin Luther King. This happened to, you know, 
Andira Gandhi, whoever. And uh, I take their word for it. I don't, they're writing it. They're, they researched it. I don't need to know what the, all their notes. Right. They don't show me their index cards. <laughs> right. Although, although, you know, I do have my big plastic box. I've tried to use the Robert Greene, Ryan Holiday method. I'm not very good at it, to be honest with you, making the notes. And that's... Then, then don't do that method. That, that's why, like, I don't, I'm not very good at that method either. I, that's why most of the time I'll tell a story. Yeah. About myself. Even if I'm writing about some somebody else, I'll tell about why this person fascinates me. Oh, you know, Louis Armstrong, what is he doing in this photograph that's so amazing? And like, I wish my life was like that and yeah. blah, blah, blah. So I think that's that's an that's a great example. Like you've referencing the Yale study. Like so one time uh, Tim Ferriss talks about the deal where you go and I don't think he, uh, I think it was either from a study or just it's one of his wild experiments where you go and ask somebody for a 10% discount all day, hamburger, it's coffee. Noah Kagan, by the way. Okay. Was it? No. Okay. So Noah, well, it, no, Tim, I'm not saying Tim doesn't advise that, but like, yeah. that is like a cornerstone of what like Noah okay. Kagan always says. And that he told it to me, this is in 2014. And to this day, I still do it. Okay. I did it. And it was like, kind of like you're asking for the seat. I, I, I hated it. But it felt so good after I started doing it, asking people for, you know, like I was at the Buffalo Exchange, which is this old resale shop in Boulder one time. And this girl, it was so funny. I I, I go, I told my daughter, I said, now watch this. I'm going to show you how you, you can just practice your negotiation skills and build confidence. So I go, will you give me a 10% discount on this? And she goes, oh yeah, sure. And I'm like, oh hell, that was easy. And she goes, was there something wrong with it? I go, no. And she's like, well, why do you want a discount? I go, because I just want to pay 10% less. She goes, oh, <laughs> no, I can't do that. But then just getting over that, it was like, it wasn't even about winning the negotiation. For me, it was like building confidence, putting myself into a position where yeah. I was probably going to be rejected. The odds are you're going to get the rejection. And so that would be a cool article about overcoming rejection. Put sure. yourself in a, in, a, in, a, in a very low consequence situation of, having rejection. So, okay. Or how, about, or how about the title is the time I was rejected a hundred times in a row <laughs> or, you know, yeah. but like, like when Noah told me, he said, he said 10 minutes within 10 minutes of this, of us concluding our interview, he said to me, I want you to go to a Starbucks, order a coffee and then ask for a 10% discount. So I did it. Uh, and I was scared to death. Like it was so nerve wracking. And of course they said no, but then over time, I got better at asking for that 10% discount. Now it's like not, you know, it's, and then what was great was when I was single after that, like I was, you know, in between things and I was single, it was a great thing to describe to like someone I was on a date with, and then we would go and do it. And then I would get rejected all the time. And she wouldn't like, yeah, just whatever reason women get the 10% discount more. And, uh, you know, that was always, you know, he became useful in my life for many reasons. And well, it, you know where it becomes an ancillary benefit is, are you, all right, I just had this happen today. Are you one of these people that if, if I call you and you don't recognize my number, now, if you're like me, you probably won't pick up the phone, but sometimes we're just curious. You answer the phone and somebody starts talking and you have no idea who they are. Will you ask them, who is this? Or do you feel bad that they know you and you don't know them? So you try to play along until you can figure it out. What do you do? I play along until I can figure it out. Same. Okay, same. But you know what? Since I've started doing the negotiation thing and not caring so much, this guy, this person calls me today. I don't know who it is. And I go, yeah, wait a minute, stop. I don't know who you are. Who, who, who am I talking to? I used to would never do that. I feel so bad about it. But now just putting myself in what those positions. What if it's positions. like your cousin or like... <laughs> Well, your, uh, your friend or whatever. Yeah. You know, okay. That's the, I don't, I don't know, man. I don't feel as bad as I once did. I'd be like, well, I don't have your number. We don't talk that often. I'll save it this time. I just don't feel as bad as I once did. And I think it's because by asking for the discount or randomly smiling at people, not creepy, but just having the confidence to look at a cashier and greet them with a smile and you be the one that's not an alpha. I don't mean that, but just, you're just the kind of the one that's going to set the tone for how things are going to go. I think it does have an ancillary benefit in other situations to where, again, you don't come off as the alpha male, but you just, you start to better realize the, the stakes of situations. The things that we play such high stakes on, like, wait a minute, I want to know who I'm talking to. Who, who is this? I'm sorry, I don't have your number. 
you know, who is this? Oh, it's Joe. Oh, Joe. Sorry. I don't know why I don't have your number. I should have your number. What's up? Those are not high stakes, but we place such yeah. high stakes on them. So I think it's, you're so, right. There that's we go. a good point. That's a story also. There and you go. By the way, the, the way you just told that story. Okay. Now you're, you're totally right. Like I could, it's not that high stakes. I should be more comfortable doing this, but I didn't, you didn't quote me a study. You just told me your experience. Yeah. If you quoted me a study, I would, oh, a study says, I would gloss <laughs> over. I'm like, I don't know if that's true or not. Like that's a controlled setting in this study. Uh, you know, the whole thing with social science, any social science is that there are studies and then there might be a different reality. And so you have to, you have to determine after you read the study, how close is this to reality? How do you do that through, through your own experience? Yeah. Like, no, I I think that's I think that's exactly right. I think that's one of the things. Again, I don't think I've given myself enough just free uh, freedom to be able to go. Yeah, you do know some stuff, Jason. Go write about it. Just because you don't have, because I've always had the attitude. Again, if I'm writing about it, I need that. Again, maybe it's overcoming imposter syndrome or something. But if I quote Ryan Holiday to your point, if I if I reference, you know, ego is the enemy or the obstacle is the way, then okay, this, then see, I know who Ryan Holiday is. I read his stuff. So you should listen to me because I read smart people. I think I fall yeah. victim to that a lot. Well, like, let's say, let's say Ryan, you know, like in his last book, Discipline is Destiny, mm -hmm. he wrote about Babe Ruth. And you could say, as Ryan Holiday says about Babe Ruth, blah, blah, blah. But that's not, okay. And okay, it's good to, if you're just repeating his words, you should reference who he is. You shouldn't plagiarize. But the story might've affected you in a different way. So you might read about Babe Ruth and now you can read about his whole story on Wikipedia or whatever. And then you might say, you know, the story of Babe Ruth, but this is why it affected you. Okay. With Ryan, he was impressed with Babe Ruth's destiny. And, but with you, it might be something else. Uh, and so you could still tell the story of Babe Ruth. Maybe you mentioned Ryan, maybe you don't. It's not that important. It depends how much of, you're borrowing his idea as opposed to the story. But if you have your own idea about why the story of Babe Ruth is interesting to you, nobody has the lock on Babe Ruth. Many people have written stories about him. Now you are one of the people writing stories about him. So yeah, I, you know, I like, like sometimes that. I've written even about like commercials that affected me. And, and I would say, why I saw this commercial and here's what happened. And I would maybe have a link to the YouTube video of it. And I had no idea who did the commercial. I, I, wouldn't research that. I maybe should give credit for it. But because I'm writing on this commercial, I've even had the creators of commercials reach out to me and say, you totally get it, what we were trying to do when we made that commercial. And I was, now I have a new person to, to communicate with about commercials. And so it's kind of an adventure to tell these stories because then you meet people and you, you, uh, you meet people like we're meeting and, and, and so on. And we're all traversing these highways of story and storytelling and why things impacted you and, and expressing it. And that's putting yourself out there. Think about it. Putting yourself out there doesn't mean more people read you. That's the, res that's maybe a result of putting yourself out there. Putting yourself out there means actually taking part of yourself and putting it out there. Yeah. <laughs> Meaning you telling your, the things that you've always been afraid to take out of yourself and hand to others. That's what putting your out, yourself out there means. And that's what people are afraid of and why it's hard. Not because it's hard to get readers. It's hard to take yourself and give it to other people. Yeah, yeah. Let me ask you this, because you, you do so many of the things that I want to do with the writing, the podcasting. Again, I kind of like... I like to think that I've followed the Stephen Pressfield model. I think I've turned pro, even though I'm still you know, operating at an amateur level. I do treat this as a profession. I take it very sure. seriously. Of the things that you're doing right now, two questions, James. What are you having the most fun doing? Because I know you love to write. I know you haven't written fiction in a long time that I'm aware of. And I'm pretty, I stay up with what you're doing pretty constantly. So first question, what's your favorite thing you're doing? And why? And two, when you have an idea for a book, do you dive into writing a book or do you do the blog? Do you do it in a newsletter? Like, because my problem is on the book thing, 
and I have so many ideas and I'll start them. And I try to do like the Stephen Pressfield. I, I do try to write every day, minimum thousand words every day, but it won't be the same project. You know, it'll be like one day I'll write on this book that I might be playing with, but I try to just exercise the muscle. So how do you stick with something like whenever you did um, skip the line, which by the way, I went to my wife, the, the day that you first said, skip the line, I said, James just threw out a great idea for a book, but I know he's going to write it. And I'll be danged if I, like a month later or something, you go, you talked about your new book, skip the line. I knew that was going to be a book as soon as you first mentioned it. <laughs> yeah, no, I, I actually, I actually love that book. Like it, it, it choose yourself is like my best selling book. Probably my favorite book that I've written is, is skip the line at this point. But, um, I don't always stick at things. Like I, I kind of, fish in a lot of different watering holes and wherever I find fish is what people then see. And so even for a book, it might start off like, you know, some, I might have some experiences that happened to me and I had some realization from it. And so I'll start writing those stories. And if they're compelling and I could see if they're compelling by how many people read them, then I start to form the idea of a book around like some collection of articles that I've written that seem to resonate well. Uh, and so that's really how I come up with the idea for, for a book. I don't know. This is an important thing. Nobody knows what's, you can't imagine, for instance, what will be interesting to people. Like even when you start a business, you don't, and this is why, by the way, your idea of buying a business as opposed to starting one is, is a safer idea than starting one. Cause when you're buying a business, you're probably buying one that's somewhat successful already, but people don't really know in general what ideas will be attractive to other people. So when you start a business, uh, all your friends who say, man, that's a great idea for a business, please do it. And then when you finally make the product or the business or the service or whatever, suddenly all, you go to all of these friends and they're like, ah, no, I'm busy right now. Like maybe later though, let me, mm -hmm. maybe later I'll buy it. You don't know until you create something and, and do it, what people will be interested in. So you, it, that's why it's good to start with experiments, basically. Oh, I'm going to write an article or I'm going to tweet something or I'm going to, uh, uh, you know, I'm going to, instead of making a product, I'm going to do it as a service and see if people are willing to pay for this service. So then I don't have to spend a million dollars making a product and raising money and all that, uh, before actually knowing if there's a market. I, I have a friend, he had an idea, um, that was, it was like a cybersecurity idea, like to pr protect companies in from different, a specific kind of software hack that's very common. And he went to a major fortune 10 company and he had a meeting with a, a former classmate of his, like they were best friends in grad school. And they now, and now this person was the decision maker at a fortune 10 company or a fortune 20 company. And so my friend goes there and he talks to his friend who again is the decision maker and his friend says, and his friend brings 15 people into the meeting. So there were all the people who have, who are involved and they're all like, oh my God, this is the most amazing product you're making. Uh, we will buy it. This will save us $40 million a year. How much does it cost? And my friend said 1 million. Oh my God. So we had just have to spend 1 million and we're going to save 40 million a year. Of course we would buy this if you made it. Uh, it's a done deal already. And so my friend raised money on the basis of this, made the product, goes back and a guy's like, oh, we don't, you know, have it in the, we can't do it this year because it's not in our budget. And my friend's like, but you said though, uh, you know, it's going to save you 40 million a year. So it would, obviously that would make the budget. And he, and his friend was like, yeah, but we have other things where we could, we could buy where we could save 60 million a year. Yep. And so my friend never sold to this person. He just, you can't know in advance. You, that's the part of the risk of a startup. And so it's the same thing with writing. You can't, you can't have a book idea. That's why not writing a novel is a scary thing. You have to write the whole novel before someone will even read it. Yeah. And Nonfiction is a little easier because you could write, you can experiment and see what people would be interested in and reduce your risk. But it's hard to know what people are going to be interested in. And positive feedback actually doesn't help you. Only negative feedback helps you. So you have to know what people are, why someone's not interested in something. Like the, the only information my friend really got from his good friend, the decision maker, was the, the decision maker could spend that million on buying something that could save him 60 million a year. We only learned that after he started the business and made the product and so on. So that's a, a long way of saying, I don't know what I'm going to stick with. I just have to try lots of things. And then I see what is resonating with people, whether it's 
a, a book idea or a profession I want to go into or a business I want to start, uh, I have to do it to, to know what people are interested in. Now, what do I enjoy doing most? I enjoy doing the podcast right now. I'm, you know, as I've expressed on this podcast before, I'm trying to, after a 25 year break, become, you know, just as good at competitive chess as I used to be. And I'm writing about that whole experience. And actually, I don't know if people will be interested in it, but I love doing it. And so I, I, and everybody kind of goes through this to some extent. So may, hopefully people would be interested in, in a story about adult improvement. Um, but yeah, those are the things I'm excited about. I wonder if there's a way that you could tie that. I mean, it, it goes right into uh, NAR country, you know, the, your, your chest yeah. passion. I mean, it's just not park skiing, but I think that's, that's why I yeah. asked Stephen Collar to come on the podcast. Cause yeah. he was writing about exact, I didn't ask him on to help him, although I'm happy to help Steven and he's a friend and the book was great and I highly recommend it. But I went on for self, I had him on for selfish reasons. I wanted him to help me. Yeah. And that's a part of the story of this journey is all the people I asked for help. Tell me what you are doing so I could benefit from it. So I want to tell you kind of a funny story that goes right in line with the, your friend and the business, because I know you have an interest in politics. So another thing that's funny, like if you're, if you're a candidate for office, which I've been, I was a city councilman here and I ran for Congress. Oh. It's the exact same way. Everybody's like, yes, you should run. I will vote for you. And they might even put a sign in your yard and they, they might even give you James a hundred bucks, a thousand bucks, but they won't go vote. It's, it's, it's so frustrating. It's so annoying. I mean, it's like, especially like in running for Congress, you think, oh, it's a great idea. You've got all these people behind you and you've got a half a million dollars for your first reporting that you, that you think you're going to raise and you raise a hundred grand because when the, when the reality comes, everybody's like, well, you know, I, I've got this friend that's a friend of your, your opponent. And so anyway, and, yeah, and, and an there area you go. that you're interested in, because I know, again, you have the fast stage of politics. It works the same way. You may think that you got a surefire candidacy and then all of a sudden everybody's just like, yeah, well, no, I, I really think you should run. I'm just not going to help you win. <laughs> well, and also there's, there's, it's one thing, the general election in November, but first you got to deal with the primary yep. and the primary, nobody votes in like a midterm oh. election for Congress. Yeah. Nobody votes except terrible. senior citizens. Yeah. So who decides how, how do you get elected? Well, you have some judge who basically knows all the voters has yep. to basically say, I like this guy. And right. what does this judge want you to do? He wants you to hire his pollster so that you hire the right, his friend, and that's going to cost you 30,000 a month or whatever. So, so people don't know, like to win for Congress, as I'm sure you realize you have to buy into this machine mm -hmm. and then you're stuck as a cog in that machine, which is why so many people in Congress are just, you know, they're just like robots walking around saying whatever other people want them to say. And it's a, a, I'm sure it was a frustrating thing for you to, to run for Congress and see what was going on. It was weird because I, it was at a time, I used to think that's what I wanted to do. And then it had completely fallen off my radar and I got recruited into it, but it came, it became almost one of like your experiments. I was like, well, wait a minute. First of all, I had some very influential people asking me to run. And so it's like, how arrogant of me to just go, nah, I'm good. You know, it, it, there was, it was a no-lose situation because I didn't have the diehard ambition that I probably had in my younger years. But so it was like, I will never have the regret of wondering what if. That could have been a really cool thing to, because to, I've, I've always had an interest in public service and trying to make things better. But now I lost, but that's okay. I went through the process and, and it actually led to what I'm doing now. I, I, the, the best part about it was communicating with people. I got to do a lot of public speaking. And I was like, that part was fun. I want to keep doing that, just not in the political realm, more along the lines of just, you know, helping people. So it, it was a, it was a win. So you, you bought your first business at 28 when you, with no experience and blah, blah, blah. You worked for Worldcom and Enron, the two biggest scandals in public company history. Yep. Um, and you ran for Congress. Uh, and you were a city councilman. If I go to your website, there is none of this stuff. <laughs> you have, so you have, you have good, the reason why you have all these good ideas and good ways of thinking on your website is because you have all these experiences where you've learned. It's a real diversity of experience you have where you learn many things. And, and that, that's what I want to hear. Okay. Um, okay. you know, like, and again, I'm not, this is not criticism at all. Like, you know, this is what I want. Hey, you're want mentoring me, man. You're mentoring me. I've got to be able to take it, right? Yoda yeah, wasn't always if, nice like, to Luke. 
yeah, I'm not saying any of your ideas are wrong. Like, yeah. I want to read your ideas, but now you're telling me why I want to read your ideas. And that's, you know, and again, I, I feel like I'm beating this dead horse, but I'm just like amazed every time you open your mouth, there's like another incredible story there. <laughs> I wish I had your background. I could tell all these stories. So, like, you know, at some point you, you run out of stories, you have to create new ones. <laughs> and, um, uh, but and that's what I initially thought is that I'll run out of stories, but you never do. Cause there's always ways you could slice everything into finer and finer pieces of, of gold. You know, a diamond sliced up is still diamonds. Well, you, you never lose the diamond aspect. James, and, I, I sent an email to James Quan Dahl and I ended up a year and a half, two years later on the James Altucher show, dude. You're right. I'm like a I'm like a modern day Forrest Gump. I'm kind of like Forrest Gump. That's I, I just it's 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 kind of random, you know. So so like, you know, uh, again, you want to be able to convey that to lots of people, and you want to be able to pu public speak about that, and you want to maybe consult because of these experiences mm -hmm. or whatever it is you want to do. You want to have that energy behind you so that you could do all these things, and but now, uh, now you have to figure out the right way to, to tell these stories in the right form and the right, you know, set of skills you need to tell these stories, which, you know, could, could be very easy. And, uh, and, and, you know, that's what I think now is important for you to explore in this part of your, your, your journey towards, you know, creating this, the, you know, making your podcast even bigger than it is, making your writing even bigger than it is, making your public speaking even more compelling. And I'm not saying it's, it's not compelling now. I haven't heard you public speak, but you want you want people to tell their friends. It's it's one thing when they say they like you. It's another thing when they tell their friends, you'll love this guy. Cause then that's real. Yeah. And then other people hire you that you don't know. And uh you know that's where it gets exciting. But there's these kind of picks and shovels things, which is okay. Just some of these things you're saying to me, write it down and okay. start, you know, and then use some technique to do it. Like, and the way you get technique is just read some other great writer you like right before you write. And maybe how would this person say it? And that's the way you kind of practice finding your own voice in whatever medium it is you want to use, whether it's public speaking or podcast or like friend Joe Rogan, I think he's very authentically curious when he interviews someone. Yeah. And he's also very confident. And I would like to interview as as good as him. Sometimes I think I do, sometimes I don't. And uh, uh but I like listening to him sometimes or I like listening to comedians sometimes before I go up and do something similar to them because it inspires me a little. And that's one way you could learn how to c communicate like the people you most admire. And uh uh, so, I, so anyway, these are, these are kind of my initial thoughts. Like you'll come back on the podcast, obviously, like when you ha go through a round of this and, and or have other questions and, and concerns, but, um, uh, yeah, I think, you know, look, I, you got a lot out of me. Like I really enjoyed talking about all this stuff and, and hearing some of your stories and, and I look forward to hearing more of them or reading them or whatever. And and I enjoyed, you gave me a chance to tell some of my stories. So this is always a good thing. And uh, I appreciate it. Thank, I'm glad you reached out to James Quandall, who, you know, we're good, James and I are good friends. He's been on the podcast and a and great guy. So shout out to James Quandall. He's, he's got his own podcast, the James Quandall Show. So, uh, uh, you know, again, uh, Jason Wright, we could find you at Jason. So tell me, where, where's the best place you want people to find you? So the website is jasonwrightnow.com. That's just kind of my, that's where everything's housed. The news, the Vitruvian letter is my newsletter. Please sign up for that. And then check out the the show, the Jason Wright show. I'd be really grateful for people courses. to give it. Yes. Okay. So also you can go out to the Apple store and download the Vitruvian lab or just my name, Jason Wright, the app. I'm putting the first courses in there right now. And so download that and then watch for the courses. I'll be launching my massively transformative habits very shortly. And so I'd be grateful just to uh, follow along. And um, I th James, I got to tell you, man, this is, I told you before, whenever it was just you, Jay and I, before I think Jay started recording, this is surreal for me. I always tell people the reason why I listen to your show, it has more utility value. And I mean that. And I mean that I, I choose that word very deliberately. Your podcast has more utility value than any 
podcast I've ever listened to. And your, your willingness to just kind of share your ideas and say, here, here's a great idea. Go run with it. Uh, you're the reason why I write 10 ideas every day. You're the reason why oh, I started great. a podcast. You're the reason why I published my first work of fiction, which um, if it's okay, not a shameless. Stone club, Chiseler. The Stone Chiseler. It was part of the 30-day challenge. You, you put it out there. And so I was like, okay, if James says I can write a book in 30 days, I'm going to go for it. It may suck, but I'm going to do it. So um, what you're doing is impactful. And by the way, when you were on with Cal Fussman, I do think you are a very good interviewer. I know you critique yourself very harshly on that, but you've taught me as intelligent and as accomplished as you are, you're still willing to go on with these experts and ask them questions and not care about, well, God, should I know this? And and that was hard for me because I have, again, the imposter syndrome. If I'm interviewing some PhD, I want to sound like, hey, I'm so grateful you're here. I want to sound like I'm smart and this is worth your time. But you have shown me that someone very bright can go, wait a minute, will you, will you repeat that? I don't know what you just said. And so I think you, uh, you're an incredible interviewer and I've learned a lot from you. So that's, I just want to get that out. And so I'm so grateful, man. I really appreciate it. I really appreciate it. Like there's so many times I look back at older interviews sometimes and think, oh, I wish I could have done that a little bit better. You know, and just, sometimes that's healthy. Sometimes it's not. Yeah, no, I appreciate it. And, I, and look, I really appreciate you wanting to come on and, and again, sharing your issues and, and some of your stories and, and letting me tell mine and everybody should check out your website. And then hopefully we'll check out your, your stories when you write them down or talk about them on your podcast or whatever. So Jason Wright, and it's W R I G H T by the way, for people who go to Jason right now.com. But Jason, thank you so much for coming on the podcast. Super appreciate it. Definitely come on again when you have the next chapter to share in your stories. You got it, James. Thank you so much, brother. In Tresto, Sucubitril Volsartan Tablets is the number one heart failure brand prescribed by cardiologists and has helped over 1 million people with heart failure. It's a prescription medicine that treats adults with long-lasting chronic heart failure and works better when the heart cannot pump a normal amount of blood to the body. Don't take Entresto if pregnant. It can cause harm or death to an unborn baby. Don't take Entresto with an ACE inhibitor or Alice Kieran. Or if you've had angioedema with an ACE or ARB. Don't take with Alice Kieran or within 36 hours of taking an ACE inhibitor. The most serious side effects are angioedema, low blood pressure, kidney problems, or high blood potassium. Angioedema is swelling of your face, lips, tongue, and throat that may cause death. If it causes difficulty breathing, get emergency help. Ask your doctor about Entresto. To learn more, visit support.entresto.com or call 833-446-6699. For pricing, visit entresto.com backslash cost. If you can't afford your medication, Novartis may be able to help. Diving deep into your passions has never been easier. Thanks to Amazon Prime. You get all-in-one access to the things you need so you can get more out of the things you love. With a range of services including Prime Video, Amazon Music, and Prime Fast free shipping. Amazon Prime is like your personal mission control for all the things that inspire. From shopping and streaming to saving, it's on Prime. Visit Amazon.com slash Prime to get more out of whatever you're into. It's on Prime.